know how I love talking to people who are embracing the holistic paradigm and helping people and their pooches. Well, that's why we're jumping on Zoom now to head over to Southern Ireland to speak to Lisa Tully and how she's using natural solutions to help owners and their dogs. I'm Anna Webb. Welcome to A Dog's Life. Lisa, welcome to A Dog's Life. Oh, thanks so much, Anne. I'm delighted to be here. Well, I'm delighted you've joined because you reached out and I was just so fascinated by your website and you've done quite a lot of radio work as well, talking about the healing work that that you do. So, you know, explain a little bit more about yourself. So I come originally from a science background. I studied uh, chemistry and biology in university and I thought I would end up in veterinary medicine. And I got accepted into vet schools, but the fees were so high that I ended up in pharmaceuticals with my science. So I ended up quite left brain. (laughs) (laughs) And I think I needed to experience that world a little bit before I, I flipped over into the more holistic side of life. Yeah, gosh. So you actually, right. So you worked in a pharmaceutical company. I did. I worked in London. Uh, I worked in London for seven years in and out of the major London hospitals there working with consultants and professors. Right. Gosh, that must have been extraordinary, actually. Very character building. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) And it means I have no fear of, you know, white coats or dealing with doctors like vets nowadays who I work a lot with. I'm, you know, it doesn't faze me. Yeah, it doesn't faze me. No, it's interesting that whole psychology of of the white coat, it creates such a barrier, I I think, between, you know, the normal people and the white coats on purpose in a way. Oh, absolutely. Um, But I think that that's probably disintegrating a little bit because I suppose in my work, I experience a lot of sick animals that have popped out the other end now of veterinary care. And I I experienced it firsthand that people are quite disheartened with what vets have to offer these days. Yes, I concur. I I concur. I feel it's very limited. I feel I just wish vets would open out a little bit and um, be more integrative. You know, because in the study that I did, it was all about integrative medicine so that, you know, you would build in some of the modalities that, you know, I know you're mad about, like traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture, which is quite a household kind of word, isn't it? People understand, don't they, what acupuncture is, Lisa? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's spread so far and wide and people have had firsthand experience of it now. Most people, whether for themselves or their animal friends. Yeah, absolutely. And I love the fact that you love uh, TCM, um, traditional Chinese medicine, because it's something I've really pursued with my own dogs, actually, and recommended for clients to go and, you know, see a a qualified acupuncture vet. One of my dogs, Mr. Binks, he's only got one hip, you see, and I took him on as a a rehome. So he's had so much acupuncture, you wouldn't believe it. Oh, you would believe it. And he's grand, you know, he really is. Is. He he really whizzes around, um, even though he's only got one hip. But it helps not only physically, but but emotionally, doesn't it? Acupuncture, working on an animal's meridians. Explain a bit more about that and and the emotional context where you know we've got Christmas coming up. Before we've got Christmas, we've got the start of the dreaded fireworks season. You know, there's the change of the seasons going on at the moment. There's a lot of change, a lot of stress in the air at the moment, particularly with the cost of living crisis and you name it. And could acupuncture really work emotionally? Uh, so for me, when I work with the animals, um, I, I use the traditional Chinese medicine in the sense that I allow the animal to show me which meridians they have that's out of balance. OK, because I so I, I flip it, I bring it up. I don't analyze the animals. They tell me what's going wrong. And that will include mental, emotional, physical, spiritual problems. It encompasses everything. 
because the way I work is that physical problems begin in the mental, emotional or spiritual layers. So it just depends on how entrenched a problem is and when it becomes more chronic and entrenched, it, it manifests as the physical condition. So the animals show me what meridians are out of balance and then they show me what herbs, essential oils or whatever flower essences they need to bring those specific meridians back into balance. So I would use a bit of acupressure, um, but mostly I would use them self-selecting. It's incredible. I know. Well, I've I've actually done a, a CPD course actually on um, on self selection. Where there was this wonderful horse as the case study, and um, they presented the horse with a whole variety of different herbs, you know, in these kind of big big dishes kind of thing. And it was extraordinary. So the horse actually selected. Yeah. So I can't remember the herb he chose now off the top of my head, but it was it was extraordinary. And what what is the actual term for this in animals? terms Lisa it's called zoo pharma cognacy so that's a big scientific word <laughs> and when you break it down a zoo it just basically means animals that know how to self-medicate yeah, it's, it's 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 brilliant, and it's it's really it's quite on trend. I don't like to use that phrase, but it, it, you know there are CPD courses on this going around at the moment to raise awareness and help you know nutritionists and even behaviorists to you know combine more to their actual practice by really understanding that kind of animals know intuitively what to do. Yeah, it's I, I'm glad that it's spreading like in you're based in the UK. So it is really big over there. Over here in Ireland, you still feel like a bit of a trailblazer. Uh, so we're just raising awareness about it more and more. And it never gets old. And it, what especially doesn't get old is how the animals respond and how their people are left kind of open mouthed. <laughs> you know, look at that. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, totally. But, you know, I'm still really interested. So we've just said that word, <laughs> zoo, farmer, cognacy. How does it feel for you having spent years, I'm sure, getting a BSc honours, you know, which I'm awfully impressed with, I must say. I, I actually opted for mine to be a BA because I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't bear to be a scientist. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I had the choice, you know, and I went, no, I'll, I'll go with the BA, please, not a BSc. But I remember my friend Pamela, she was like, no, no, you want the science, Anna. You've done psychology. You want the science. I'm like, oh, no, I don't. I'm, a, I'm on the art side of it all, really. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> exactly. So, but how does it sit with you? And I mean, do you talk to any of your previous colleagues about this? You know, because it's quite a shift change, you know. Oh, it is a shift change. And, you know, I don't really speak to much of my previous colleagues about this. Who I speak to about it in depth and with great fun is my friends who are uh, homeopathic vets. So they're they're very holistically minded anyway. And I've been introducing the idea of zoo pharmacognosy to them and they've actually taken it into their healing practice. So when they say identify, say, two possible homeopathic remedies for the animal and they're not quite sure, they'll then offer the homeopathic remedy for the animal to smell. And the animal will either start to mouth the bottle or lick their lips. So they know how to recognize the signs that the animal is saying yes to that specific remedy. So they use it all the time now. <laughs> I love that because I, I use a lot of homeopathy. My vet is Barbara Jones from way up sort of north in Shropshire, Lisa, and she runs an organic dairy farm as well. She's amazing. I, I liken her to an earth mother, you know, because she really is all about the soil. And for her, until we fix the soil, you know, we're all doomed, you know, <laughs> um, which in many ways is, is not wrong. Um, so she's extraordinary. Yes, yes. And I'm sure I'm sure you've heard of her, actually. She goes kind of beyond everything, really. I, I trust her implicitly as well. And I think that's so important, isn't it? When you're working with someone with your dog or your horse or your cat or parrot or whatever you need to feel that trust and confidence 
Oh, definitely. And what I love about uh, vets like that is that they have both sides of the coin. They yes. have, you know, they have the science, but they have the holistic. So if they tell you use pharmaceuticals, I totally agree with them, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there's a place for pharmaceuticals. Yes. There really is, but used, you know, strategically. Exactly, exactly. So I'll trust when they say, you know, I'll be like, oh, is it really time for pharmaceuticals? OK, <laughs> you know, it's their last resort, not their go to. Yes, exactly. But there is so much more choice, I, I think, you know, on the, the holistic side of the fence. You know, the grass is, I think, greener, but there's so many tools like I know you use flower essences quite a lot in your practice. Yeah, yeah. Flower essences are pretty amazing. Um, again, animals can self-select them as well. But the way I love to work with flower essences is that uh, when people come to me where there's a problem with their animal friend, often there's some level of human animal mirroring going on. Mm. The animal is expressing something on behalf of their person that they need to look at. And that's where I actually work with the animal and they will select essences for their person as well as essences for themselves or to share or whatever. And when I explain to people what set of essences, what the story that the essences tell, I said, your dog wants you to have these because they think this is going on. I have never, ever, ever had any one person say that's not right. <laughs> Gosh, no, that's <laughs> well. It's it's true, isn't it? I mean, there's we can be. I know I can be. You know, an emotional contagion to my dogs. I mean, you know, the the sad truth of it is, I suppose us humans, we we have to bear the brunt of stress. I wish life didn't have any stresses, but we have them. You know, we've got to pay the mortgage. We've got to fit in a supermarket shop or we're not going to eat for two days you know or you know whatever it might be and this stress cortisol you know dogs can smell it so they know when we're happy and when we're sad absolutely but it's it's it goes even much deeper than that you know sometimes like you're working on actual physical conditions say a dog has ibd and you dig around a little bit into the case sure enough the person suffers from ibd or has done in the past or you know it can be really anything uh you know not just goes way beyond fears and and then also on the positive side it's like sometimes i'm working with an animal and I can really feel that their human really takes care of themselves and the well-being in the animal. So sometimes they might just need a little tweak for me and, whoa, the results just just flow much more quickly because the human is minding themselves on all levels just as well as minding their, their doggy friend. Yeah, yeah. Well, we live so closely together. That's the thing, isn't it, really, Lisa? You yeah. know. So when you go and, and, and visit, you know, someone, you know, in their home, are they always receptive to the idea of, for example, building herbs into their routine? Or are they more happy with something a little bit more concrete? Does, do, you, do you know what I mean? Uh, so, yeah, like I, I guess it, it, how I tailor what I offer is, first of all, I take a few things into consideration. How seriously ill is the animal? Because if somebody comes to me with a very seriously ill animal, they'll, they'll usually try anything I tell them to. Um, but then I also factor in how much time or how busy the person is would be the next thing. So if the animal's not extremely ill, it's like, well, do I have a bit of give and take? So if the people are very, very busy, they mightn't have time to offer things on a self-selection basis. So that's when I might use things like flower essences that they just have to stroke into the coat and it's done or a mixture of both as we go along. So people tend to be pretty uh, bought in when I do a house visit based on anything I bring that I've in initially intuited because the animal responds so well. So I was at a, a dog there last week that's just been diagnosed with Cushing's mm. and I know that the dog needs a bit of milk thistle to cleanse the liver amongst many other things but whilst I was there I put out a little like a half a teaspoon of milk thistle powder, wetted it with a little bit of water and put the plate down and I said watch this 
this and the dog went over and just licked it all up and the person was just like oh my god she's such a fussy dog I can't believe she just ate that and I said that's because her body needs it so once you do that boom <laughs> people believe <laughs> yeah yeah well milk thistle is is amazing I mean that is such a powerful herb isn't it yeah yeah it really really is there's so many powerful herbs out there um but if you put down like as you saw I'm sure with the horse um if you put down five different herbs the dog will only select the ones that they need so they might only select two out of the five you know, so it, their herbs are very powerful, but then so is the innate animal wisdom, their body awareness. Yes. And that's something, of course, I think, you know, over time we've, we've lost, haven't we? You know, with technologies kind of taking, well, totally it's taking over with all these apps that tell you what to eat. What, <laughs> and it's very worrying. I'm not into it myself. Oh, yeah. It's like, you know, we can't even find our left and right anymore. You know, we need Google to tell us where to go. <laughs> I know. I know. My, um, oh my gosh, my, my sort of handyman, oh God, he made me laugh one day. We were in the garden. And I don't know, we were talking about Google Maps, you know, and putting in where you're going. And you see everybody, you know, in London, they're just looking at their smartphones, following the, the path to wherever they're going, you know. And I remember the days when you had an A to Z and you had to work it out, go backwards. On, oh, anyway, long story, but he just cracked this joke going, Anna, if they didn't have their smartphones, millennials would never find their way home. So... <laughs> <laughs> um, I did laugh, actually, I did laugh, little little side thing. Going back a bit, what really interests me, actually, Lisa, is far more of this, I guess, psychic connection mm. that you have. Because I think on your journey, you know, you say that you've learnt from the animals and, and where you've been and, and experienced this. So have you been to Mongolia? Yes, yes. <gasps> Yeah. Tell us more, please. You know, you know where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I am. Um, well, there's a lady I, I work with here in Ireland and she kind of helps me uh, focus on what areas of my life. She's she's very psychic herself. And she kept saying I'd see her every six months for years. And she kept saying to me, Lisa, you're going to go to Mongolia. And I said, you said that last time, Carmel. And she's like, oh, did I? Because she forgets. And I was just like, how on earth am I going to get to Mongolia? Like, so I just forgot about it. And and then I heard that there's a Mongolian shaman that comes to Ireland and does healings. And I just took a double take. I was like, excuse me, I have to meet this woman. So I went and had a healing session with her the next time she came to Ireland because she was living in the UK at that time. And I just said to her, you know, you, you know, I want to come to Mongolia. And she's like, OK. So I went to Mongolia the following year and we we did a uh, basically a journey up into outer Mongolia <laughs> where where there was like about 40 shamans they congregated from all over different parts of Mongolia and they did this kind of 10 day ceremony and we went on horseback up into the mountains and we did like different ceremonies at different points and fire ceremonies and and through that whole experience they just inoculated me it's the only way I can think about it they just opened up something old that was in me and just needed a bit of a nudge and it was amazing wow I mean I've got I've got so sort of these images in my head of sort of you know Genghis Khan on horseback and because isn't Mongolia quite near China or is my geography completely wrong Lisa yeah it's it's it is it's next door to China Siberia those kind of places so Russia and China basically are you know they're they're big neighbors and you're right to think of Genghis Khan because when you go there they still have their traditional dress and they're still very much in touch with their horses and so they they wear all these amazing clothes and and just in a daily basis but then you get them in their shamanic gear as well and you just kind of feel like am i in a star wars movie and in actual <laughs> fact a lot of the star wars costumes were based on mongolian dress traditional dress um so it is it's just a world where you feel like you've actually left the planet and you've fallen off into this amazing edge <laughs> which is incredible where they live in a completely different reality wow and, and and so when you were there did did you you know see things that you know totally blew your mind 
Oh my God. There was, there was one, one day where we used to get up um, in the morning time at six o'clock and we would meditate to the spirit of the lake. And I could feel this energy coming from this is a sacred lake that they have there, uh, Hustavel Lake. And I could feel just this energy every day. And then at the final, final end of, of our time there, we were doing a, one last ritual beside the lake where I didn't really know what was going on. It was just me and all the Mongolians at this point. And um, they just said to me, OK, this girl here is going to take on the spirit of the lake that we've been meditating to. And I was just like, OK, because that's what the Mongolian shamans do. The spirits come into their body, whereas shamans in, say, South America, they travel to the spirits on their ayahuasca. But the Mongolians, the spirits actually come in and they start to speak different languages, light languages. And um, they make animal sounds because the spirit starts to speak to them. Men will have suddenly speak speak in a girlish tone. So this spirit of the lake came in and she was speaking in such a foreign tongue that none of the Mongolians could understand her at all. It's quite funny to watch. <laughs> there was about five of them crouched around her trying to understand. But then uh, eventually what we were allowed to do is when this girl had embodied the spirit of the lake, this regular girl we've been hanging out with for 10 days. We went up and I we gave an offering. And I, I swear to you now that when I went up to her, I could feel the, the energy. I've been feeling all those meditations throughout that time uh, beside the lake. I could feel it intensified. And that's when I knew in my own personal experience, I was just like, oh my God, this stuff works like this. You know, not that I had doubted it at any point because I'd seen so much before that, but I think this was one of the most mind-blowing things for me of the entire trip, you know? <laughs> Gosh, amazing. Yeah. I mean, did you go on your own or with a friend or was it an organized thing? Yeah, so I went I went um, on my own, but there was an uh, there was two other Irish women on the trip with me as well. Um, but they, you know, we, we ended up doing different things at different times because the shamanic energy is very strong and it can wipe you out. <laughs> <laughs> and you're just going to go, I'm not going to go to this ritual. I'm just going to have a nap, <laughs> you know, so everyone just has to take it at their own pace. So you ended up at different things at different times. But the Mongolians just kept going, you know, wow. without without missing a beat. <laughs> so interesting. It seems that East and West are so <laughs> diametrically opposed. You know, when you think of things like in India, Ayurvedic medicine, for example, which again, I love, it's all it's all there. And, and it seems that we're just so restricted sometimes by the pharmaceutical world of the West. Oh, my God, more than restricted, I'd say absolutely <laughs> dom dominated. You know, it's like you have to be so careful what words you use um, to in this kind of work, in this holistic work. So as not to, you know, step on people's toes and and the might of the pharmaceutical industry that I know from the inside out. Um, and I can say myself when I worked in the pharmaceutical industry and um, that I was blindsided as well. I just thought, yes, my drug is the best drug. And yes, I'm really helping patients. And and it's not until you pop out the other side of that, um, which my meditation practice caused me to do. And I realized I was like, wow, you know how you just get this golden handshake. And that golden handshake is not just only for the pharmaceutical reps. It goes through the across the entire industry and naturally it's going to spill into the dairy. I say it, the medical industry as well, you know. Well, well yes, and and the veterinary industry, yeah, you know, as well. You know, this is, this is the thing. I mean, it's uh, it's extraordinary. But you know, I really feel that at the moment, and there is a bit of a tide turning. People aren't as I don't think as intimidated if you mention herbs to them, for example, for say you know fireworks, bonfire night, and and for situations with with stress like moving house you know there's a there's a lot i mean a lot of brands out there now focusing on pets i mean i bet you think this is really good 
Oh, yeah. I just think it's amazing all the things that people are starting to hunt for and find. Um, you know, some of the some of the herbs that like when you when you have fireworks season happening, uh, people are starting to the fireworks are already starting to go off here in Ireland for Halloween. Mm. And, you know, so if people start to reach for the herbs now, they can really support and help their animals um, to stay a lot calmer. Um, so would you like me to share some yes. herbs that I can Oh, no, recommend? totally. No, I'd love that. Go yeah. on, everyone listening will be eager to learn. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, I want to give it on in kind of two ways. I want to do something that's really easy from your kitchen cupboard. And then I want to give you su some suggestions for people that might also want to go a little bit deeper. So because animals self-select their own herbs, if you reach into your kitchen cupboard and you take out your packet of organic ginger tea and your packet of organic peppermint tea and you make up a cup of tea of each and when it cools down, pour them into two separate bowls and leave them out and have plain water available as well. And watch your animal friend self-select. If they want that ginger and if the fireworks are going off, um, the ginger really helps them kind of feel more self-confident and feel more courageous within themselves. And then the peppermint tea, when we get nervous, and when animals get nervous, it affects our digestive system because naturally the blood flow goes to the most important parts of the body to make a fight or flight run, which would be the heart, the lungs and the extremities. So the digestive system loses blood flow. And we have all sorts of things like diarrhea and all that kind of stuff. So peppermint tea, they might select the peppermint tea to regulate their digestive system, which takes that hit when they feel really nervous. And another type of tea that you could use for is bog standard chamomile tea. Make them up that as well. <laughs> well, that's kind of the, the the real known karma, isn't it? The, the along with say valerian root. What, what do you reckon to those herbs as well? Yeah, so valerian root is a really powerful herb that I use all the time, and I use valerian root. Valerian root is an extremely good painkiller. Um, so it's not only for anxiety and deep anxiety, but it helps animals if they're old and arthritic. So if you get like, say, if you buy some valerian herb or again, you can get valerian tea bags. And what you can do is if you put some of the valerian, dry valerian herb out onto, say, a towel and you allow the, the dog or even the cat or whoever you have, any little Furby, and they'll go up and they'll sniff that herb and they might even start to lick it up. And that's a, another way that they can self-calm. And if they do self-select it, just that simple act of empowering them to self-select by making these herbs available, you reduce down their stress levels. You can, you can also do this with herbs like lavender as well, or some organic hemp powder, which is becoming more widely available also. I love this. I get the empowering thing because of course, so much, you know, particularly with dogs, you know, they, uh, there's a big wave in, in the behavior movement, which you, you'll relate to, you know, it's about letting your dog make the choices within reason, particularly in London, when you've got big roads running by a park or whatever, you can't be, yes, it's fine to go out of that gate, just mind the double-decker bus, you know? <laughs> yeah. so, you know, so there has to be practical guidelines attached to it but it is about letting dogs make choices and building their confidence in life generally I think yeah 100 percent. so you when you if you're making these things available to them you know then they just and so also because if you have a dog in London like you know London as you say it's so built up so I remember when I lived in London one thing I really craved was grass and birds and <laughs> you know yeah. it's just so, uh, so the animals crave that too so by you bringing the herbs to them you're bringing a, a, you know a, an experience of nature to them in their house if you're living in a built up city. And it's giving you the owner empowerment in a way as well to kind of relax a bit, uh, you know, take a step back, let your Furby, as you call them, make the choice because they do know what they're doing rather than us panic and think, no, no, you know, no, 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 it's got to be this, you know, actually think, no, hang on, I'm not 
totally in control here. This is a shared experience. You are my partner, my friend, my living sentient being, you know, and so you should make your own choices. Yeah, that's it. And, you know, one thing that's coming to my mind as you're speaking about that as well to, to share is that with with the fireworks season coming up, um, the there's an essential oil that probably a lot of people will already have in their homes. But if not, you can go out and grab a bottle of organic frankincense essential oil and frankincense essential oil works to heal specific fears, fear of men, fear of cars, fear of fireworks, that kind of thing. So what they could do is they could just put one drop of the pure frankincense oil on a clean cloth and leave that clean cloth in a quiet corner of a room. Now, making sure the animal can come in and out of that room if they want to, so they can remove themselves from the aroma of the oil if they want to. And you might find that during firework seasons, some of the animals, if not a lot of them, may actually curl up beside that and just sniff the frankincense oil to relieve their stress. I didn't know about frankincense oil. That is so amazing. I'm going to get some. Yeah. Because it is important as well to stay calm yourself during, you know, fireworks and be as normal as possible and not think, oh, no, you know, they're kicking off now, you know, just put the telly on. And, you know, I always roast a chicken, actually. It's kind of just something I do. So to deflect with nice um, roast chicken smells permeating around the place, <laughs> there's a lot of that because like we were saying earlier, you know, dogs pick up on our stress and then think, well, I've obviously got to be stressed out. Out, she's going off her head. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So the more that we can, you know, when we project and think about something, we're putting those thoughts and those ideas into our animal friends' minds. I mean, you just think have to think about um, some of the work that Rupert Sheldrake's done. I know, you know, Rupert. I love Rupert. Yeah. Don't, uh, I know my producer's <laughs> going to be raising his eyes now and going, oh, Anna, no, no, not more Rupert. It will always be... <laughs> favourite podcast episode. I've done quite a bit of radio with Rupert and everything. I, mean, I know and Rupert said I was a shaman and it, oh gosh, it was oh. so amazing. Listen again, everyone, to episode one. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, in his book, like he said that, you know, when he was analysing in his study and dogs that know when their guardians are coming home, that they just knew instinctively when they were coming home. And the cats, that they, whenever they tried to book in a cat visit to the vets, the cat would just disappear. Yes. <laughs> Okay, because the cat reads your thoughts, you know, so. <laughs> I think cats particularly, I know dogs do as well, but, you know, I've got a cat. When he's being a bit naughty and he's not coming in, when I do my cat flap, I bang the cat flap four times, okay, and that's his recall. And when he's ignoring me and being a naughty boy, you know, I will just think, gremlin come home now but in order for it to work it's really weird lisa i have to be in a genuine kind of worry about it so he has been out for too long you know thoughts are now going into my mind about foxes about you know all sorts of things so there's a real worry in my brain and this builds and it builds and then he comes in Wow. Yeah, he knows. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Extraordinary, isn't it? Um, so I love, I love the thought of telepathy and, you know, intention. Um, I think so much can be done on intention. Yeah, that's it. Like, it's just about kind of revisiting what your fears are and just releasing them and having the intention to rise above them. And if people feel that, like, it's all very easy, Lisa, you saying that, but I'm still nervous, um, you know, bring some support in for you. Bring some conscious support in for you. Like the emergency essence from the Australian bush flower range is one of my favorites. It's a quick, quick, uh, easy flower essence mix. And you can just put two drops of that in your water bottle with every refill during the day over the two to three week period before the fireworks start kicking off and just start to get a handle on your relationship with it and then that'll rub off on the dog as well he'll then feel that you're more stable in the situation so therefore he has the or she he or she has the ability then to be more stable if they can you're not adding to the problem then 
No, absolutely. No, gosh, Lisa, I'm, I, I love all of this focus on the flower remedies as well. But obviously, you know, we've touched on herbs here and homeopathy. But there is that, you know, communication angle. Do you think everyone has the gift, Lisa, to communicate telepathically or communicate, well, in a, in a sixth sense kind of way? hundred percent. Um, because when I teach animal communication uh, to people, they come on the course and they're quite nervous and they're like, I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm so nervous. And I just say to them, everybody receives messages in their own way. You might hear thoughts like through telepathy, hear words, feel their feelings. They might send you images, colors, sensations, just a knowingness. And it's not comparing what one person can or can't do but the real trick to it the real uh, way of helping people really connect in with that is finding the stillness within your own heart and mind because it's through your heart energy that that opens up the portal to where the animals reside effortlessly and when you can connect in on that heart level, it's like you open up that freeway of communication and you'd be surprised what you can start to pick up quite quickly. So we all have heart energy. That's it. Heart energy. Yeah. yeah. And for that, you do have to feel quite relaxed. You know, you you can't be worrying about deadlines or uh, other things, planning podcasts or whatever it might be. You know, it's almost like being in the moment. Yeah. And isn't that the gift that the animals are giving us? You know, they're telling us to slow down. If you really want to hear me and understand me, take care of yourself and slow down a bit. Yes, yes, certainly. I know definitely <laughs> all of my gang tell me that every day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lisa, gosh. So I've just so enjoyed this conversation. Can I ask, you know, with your Mon Mongolian shamanism, how do you put that into practice in daily life? Um, so it comes out when I need it to, when I'm told to bring it out. So I don't use it just willy nilly. So when I'm connecting in with an animal and my spirit guides will say to me, get the drum out. So I have a Mongolian drum that the shamans gave me. And when I start to, that drum has been blessed. So when I start to play that, it opens up the portals. So it's only for specific animals that I'm asked to do that. And I don't look for a pattern. I don't ask why this animal, but I know that then something needs to shift, whether that animal needs ancestral healing, past life healing, or their person or this it just it's basically i know we're bringing in the big guns <laughs> wow. so yeah so so it's not it's it's uh it's it's used with huge respect you know yes yes absolutely well i think everything in regard to animals should come from a very high level of respect and you know humility from the human oh i love that absolutely <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, Lisa, I really hope we can meet one day because I've, I've loved this conversation very much. Oh, really. uh, yeah, I'd love to meet too. <laughs> love, I just have to say, if people wants to, want to um, connect with me and maybe even learn from me, if they want to go to my website, it's animalhealing.ie. I can work on your animal wherever you are in the world through photos or in person. I can teach you how to do this stuff. And I also run monthly meditation sessions and educational sessions for people and their animals online as a membership program. So if that interests anybody, I'd love to hear from them. Gosh, well, it does interest me. And uh, rest assured, Lisa, all of the links are in the show notes. Oh, so, brilliant. <laughs> thank you again. All right. Thank you. That's our show, Mr. Binks. What did you think? Yes, it was interesting to learn about frankincense and how that aroma can really help calm. We should try it, Mr. Binks. And you're right, it is time for Woof of the Week. <coughs> Never forget how simple it is to include some natural herbal remedies into your dog's routine at the moment to help with fireworks and, of course, Christmas coming up. <coughs> well, I hope you all enjoyed it. If you did, go on, rate and review the show wherever you tune into your podcasts. 
Thanks again, of course, to Lisa Tully. And all the links are in our show notes. Thanks, of course, to Mike Hansen, my producer. And find out more about him at Pod People UK. And for me, I'm at Anna Webb Dogs. What's that, Mr. Binks? You're right. We will be back in your feed next Sunday. So why don't you subscribe now? You can learn about all our other features as well, like our Patreon service. We'll be back in your feed next week. Bye for now. Bye.